I'm Mina Malik Hussain and you're watching The Coffee Table and today we have a real musical extravaganza for you. <laughs> Apparently there's a whole bunch of copyright stuff otherwise right now you would have been hearing the classic Sohail Rana song, Helicopter, <laughs> if it were up to me. So just imagine that it's playing in the background. <laughs> I'm already laughing because I'm so happy. <laughs> so it is my great pleasure, as you can see, to have uh, what promises to be a fascinating conversation about music and the conservation of our sonic history, as it were. And it is my great pleasure to welcome singer, music, ethnomusicologist, and the co-founder of the Lahore Music Meet, and Peshkash, Natasha Nurani, and Farhan Ahmed Irfan, who is the Joint Secretary of the All Pakistan Music Conference and the founder and CEO of Sare Music. Hello, friends. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks hey. for having us. Thank yes. you for having us. I'm delighted. It was a, you know, I wish you were on the sofa, but it's OK. It's better to stay away from germs. <laughs> So, Natasha. True, although I miss the coffee. Yes, it's true. I also miss it. There's like nothing here in front of me. Just barren wasteland. <laughs> but at least we got the tunes. <laughs> so, Natasha, true. you know, you do all sorts of really interesting things. But I feel like for me, um, one of the most important ones is that uh, you used to manage strings. Uh, I basically worked with them at a Coke studio for season 10. Yeah. I was general manager at that point, and then they were releasing their album 30, and I got to work with them for that, and they were great. <laughs> I called them my work dads. Wow. Uh, they were awesome. And, uh, <laughs> I, work dad uh, like I got that. to feature on their new album as well. I, there was a song with me doing backing vocals. Yes. Oh my gosh. You're like strings is backing vocal. That, yeah, I think that the show is over now, so goodbye. <laughs> but, but no. So, um, amongst the many things and the many interesting things that you are doing for music in Pakistan, one of them is Peshkash. So tell me about Peshkash. What is it? So Peshkash is essentially like a hub or rep repository of music research and music itself mm -hmm. pertaining to Pakistan. So what right. that means is essentially I and a couple of other people are going around collecting cassettes, vinyls, which are essentially a And mm -hmm. we're trying to collect everyone's kind of um, things that they're willing to dispose of. And we're trying to digitize all of that content that essentially has been forgotten. Things that haven't made them their way to YouTube or mm -hmm. SoundCloud or some shady WhatsApp audio. <laughs> so we're trying to make sure that it's available online and it's available with context for a generation to come and, and for hours, to be honest, because there's a huge disconnect between what was happening pre, you know, the 90s even. It's like, mm -hmm. it's very up in the air. There are a few songs that have made it through, a few artists that have. So I feel like because I, I did my master's in this and my dissertation was based on that, so I feel like this was the natural trajectory of things. Quite right. And this is something to kind of circle back to because you are, by academic training, an ethnomusicologist, and that's also a term I, I'm interested in unpacking. But before we move on to that, hi, Farhan. In, you know, in cyberspace. <laughs> so you are the Joint Secretary of the All Pakistan Conference, which is, of course, our sort of superstar um, classical music, you know, platform. And you are also the founder and the CEO of Sare Music, which is an app. So tell me more about what does uh, Sare do? What does Sare do? What is the app about? Thank you for that introduction. Well, <laughs> Sare Music was really born out of a really deep desire to revive Pakistan's classical music. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, in Hong Kong waiting for my classes, for my MBA classes to start mm -hmm. for the next day. Yeah. And I was wanted to listen to some classical music. and it, I just couldn't find anything good online without mm. being filled with ads. Yeah. So I took it as a project um, to London Business School Entrepreneurial Summer School and then at several courses at Columbia Business School and found there was a large market that needed uh, whose entertainment needs are underserved. Mm. And this turned out to be a 36 million worldwide market who don't what? have easy access to the genre, yes, it was shocking for me as well. And with my background from the All Pakistan Music Conference that my grandfather started, my mother and I now run, yes. I've always been deeply concerned about the state of Pakistan's classical music and its artists. And 
I thought there must be a way of putting both of these together. Hmm. And the answer, in my opinion, is Sare music. Uh, it's a place where, where we're aggregating, cataloging all of the music into one place uh, to provide easy access to everyone around the world. It's a source for authentic music. Mm -hmm. And even for scholars, I was speaking to Noor Zara Kazim, who's one of the yes. only, if not, you know, very few people who, are who play the Sagar Visa, Veena. Yeah. And she said it I was so interesting to one. listen to. Mm. Because it's the only real Pakistani instrument that, out there. Yes, yes. Because a Pakistani invented it, basically. <laughs> yeah, it yes. is. Absolutely. So it, it's for, she was saying it was so interesting for her to listen to the development of Rag Pilu over time. Right. Uh, Rag Kirwani over time. Because mm. the app doesn't just have recordings from the, you know, the past... The, the recent years, it has recordings from the 1960s, yes. from the 1980s, from the 1990s. Mm. And similar to, similar to what uh, Natasha is doing, we have been digitizing our works uh, from cassettes and, and, and reels, which are mediums which are inherently vulnerable to decay. Yes. Uh, hmm. And also sort of so technological fade because if you have something, let's say, on a reel, then you need to have a, a device that can play the reel. And if you don't have that, then how do you access the reel? So, so it's sort of like a race against time also, isn't it? <laughs> well, so technology has moved on, moved on. The technology at that point in time hmm. was reels, right? Yeah. The technology in the 80s and 90s were cassettes. Of course. The technology you know. now is streaming. <laughs> and it, yeah. If if a, any genre of music, mm. like classical music, doesn't keep up with allowing people access to the latest distribution technology, mm. then it'll get left behind and it'll die out. Yeah. So yeah. part of our preservation drive, part of our you know attempt to ensure that we continue to promote the music and preserve it is the app, uh, so that people can have access to it. Yeah. Uh, so listening said, to the content mm, is a critical part of this whole equation. Absolutely. And said that there's a 36 million strong audience for uh, Pakistani classical music, then I'm assuming that obviously these are not all just Pakistanis. These are probably people sort of from the South Asian region or just even beyond anybody who's interested in the form. Because again, uh, our, our classical music is the, is the classical music of the region. Absolutely. So... Your uh, your usual players of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, mm. Nepal are there, mm. but then you have far flung regions, and and you know, right in England and the U.S. where you would expect uh, you know the Pakistani diaspora to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But then you have people from Brazil listening in. You have people from you know Argentina listening in, Mexico, where wow. you'd never expect people to be listening. Huh. We ha already have ninety five countries where Sare music is being listened to. That is unprecedented. <laughs> so exciting. Because I'm like, yeah, music is so wonderful. Listen to it, listen to it. <laughs> yeah, it's, in, it's mm. incredible. incredible. It just, the only, real, I mean, we haven't done anything special as such. I mean, mm. the music is really created by the artists. They're the real yes. champions and heroes here. Yeah, yeah. All we're doing is providing a, an, a, the latest distribution technology to ensure people have access to it worldwide. And then mm. you have... 61% of the people listening are 18 to 35 year olds. What? Which is again shocking for everyone who listens to it. It's yes. like, oh yeah, buddhe log sunte honge. Exactly. Who listens to this? Yeah, yeah the old fashioned. True. That's it's not true. Yeah. And we even did, so the All Pakistan Music Conference for <clears throat> the listeners who are unfamiliar, hmm. uh, hosts a concert of music every month in a five-day annual festival yes. where over 100 artists perform, five to 6,000 people come to attend. We did s surveys in the past few years of the people who were attending. Mm -hmm. 60, it's the same ratio, 55 to 60% are in the, in the 18 to 35-year-old age bracket. That's fantastic. I love that. I, that's wonderful. And it really sort of puts spade to that myth again, like you said, Farhan, of classical music being for old people or that it's boring or it, it might not appeal. So sort of circling back to Peshkash, Natasha, do you find that uh, sort of what's the demographic for the kind of music that, or not demographic, actually, what's the kind of music that Peshkash is um, 
conserving and putting together and archiving? I mean, at this point, we're just trying to preserve everything we can get our hands on. So we're yeah. not we're not kind of discriminating in terms of um, genres at this mm, point. Very mm, similar mm. to our work with Lower Music Meet. Yeah. Um, I you know it's a the idea is to just kind of make sure that everything is preserved. But I mm -hmm. guess a lot of the focus at this point. Uh, I guess where the APMC might be focusing on live performances, ah. I think it's uh, where I'm looking more at sound recordings. So like right. recorded music history mm -hmm. and trying to mm -hmm. understand that. And just beyond um, beyond music history, I think because there's still a lot of focus given on classical music and on um, traditional forms of music, I feel my personal kind of... Um, disposition is towards finding music that has not been heard, especially by someone yeah. who would be my age or yes. in this case, me in particular. So it's a very kind of personal <laughs> pursuit to find Call unheard <laughs> sound, essentially. Yes. <laughs> no, but it's true. And I also feel like, and the thing that kind of trickles down into literature as well, which is like where, you know, where I know things about, is that sometimes a lot of um, poetry, for example, a lot of students want to read it, but it's fallen out of print and nobody has republished it. So they can't read it. So it's not even a lack of interest, it's a lack of access to it. So for example, like I grew up with a lot of Sohail Rana songs and singing them in singing class. And a lot of them, I can't find them on YouTube. And I suppose that's the sort of thing where, you know, Peshkash could help me find my childhood classic. I mean, very similar to how Sare music is working, I feel like yeah. it's important to know that in terms of preservation and archiving, especially with music, what's happened in the past with, you know, major companies that have held music or, you know, even government organizations mm -hmm. that have worked mm -hmm. towards music, the archive may have existed, but it's, if your archive is not accessible, even if just to a small number of people, yes. you know, to, to anybody, then what's the point? Because distribution is such a major part mm -hmm. of preservation, is for it to be heard, not just for it to be kind of digitized and then locked away in hard drives that no one has yeah. access to. Uh, because as we've mentioned, the demand is absolutely there. And I think classical music and traditional music just has a bad PR game in that it, you know, it's been associated with an older lot, but it's not true. Every Everyone, yeah. everyone has their own preferences of genres, and I feel like everyone deserves to have access to pretty much all kinds of Pakistani music that has existed. Yeah, yeah. and we actually have a surprisingly really history of some really interesting music that we are going to take a very quick break and come back to talk about, so stay with us. Hi, welcome back to The Coffee Table. We're having a fascinating conversation with Natasha Nurani and Fahan Ahmed Ivan about our, mu our sonic history. And I keep saying sonic history because I know that Natasha has used this phrase and I've really taken a shine to it. <laughs> so, Natasha, when I was um, researching for this show, um, I realized that, and I obviously I follow Peshkash as well on Instagram, um, there's some really fascinating and really sort of almost whack um, things happening in, in Pakistani music in the, in the 60s and the 70s, which to me are sort of really like mind blowing. So I want you to tell me a little bit more about that. Like 70s absolutely. lolly, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, so <laughs> I mean, uh, firstly, as a venue, you had um, clubs used to exist mm. in not just Karachi, but also in Rawalpindi, yeah. where a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of bands would be playing and they'd be playing primarily surf rock. And so what they would do is they would take the genre of surf rock. And, yeah. and again, Sohail Rana Saab was at the forefront of this movement. Um, he, uh, th these bands like the AJs and the Panthers, they would basically uh -huh. be playing Latte Di Chadar or Malkos or, you know, take some rag and make it basically rock and roll. So fusion Ooh. existed well before any corporate branded show brought it in. Amazing. So, you know, that, that mm. existed. And then Lollywood was another realm altogether between the 60s and 70s because you had TV that had popped up, the film industry was definitely going into its peak in terms of production. And so I feel like a lot of the producers like Tafo Saab and um, uh, Emma Sharaf had a lot of 
I mean, yeah, it was, as you say, it was whack. Like when I hear this music for the first time, if I just accidentally come across it, I am completely blown away. I'm just like, this is not allowed. Because if you think <laughs> about it, if this stuff was released today, it would be considered non-commercial or non-Pakistani. And that's where mm. the irony stands for me, is that in terms of identifying musical roots, yeah. yes, you do have traditional forms of music that everyone has kind of been taught or has an ear for. But there's also the popular side of it like pop music not popular mm. in terms of mm. the reach it has but um the yeah i mean watching people drink fake johnny walkers in a kind of uh lollywood film is great but also for me what's most interesting is the kind of synthesizers they're using or the kind of production that they're using and again people like naheed akhtar being so versatile with some say i am sweetie which generally is a joke right now i mean for sure but Consider that in the 70s, there was this woman who was singing in Punjabi and English and Urdu yes. at the same time. And, and that also, was completely mm, normal. That is. It really is. And you know, she was singing DM in Hindi. I saw that. That's that on was YouTube. Can you, can you imagine that? Can you imagine, you imagine Masarit Nazir? That was Masarit Nazir. Like, just, yeah, just singing Bonnie M. It and is this is also phenomenal. because of cross-border <laughs> production. Yes. So it was a cross-border production <laughs> with... Yes. So, with, so with it, the, it was in yeah. Hindi. And, and again, this, the idea that uh, Nazia and Zohaib as artists were also working frequently in London with yes. a lot of Indian producers at that point, just that fluidity yeah. of music, of, of kind of lyrics, of, you know, music videos even. Mm -hmm. uh, the set director for Zohaib Hassan's videos were the same as Michael Jackson's Thriller. So, really? I mean, there's a lot of trivia that... No. Yes, yes, yes. That is awesome. That's the magic carpet. My God, yeah, yeah, we yeah. were so cool. Like, wow, my mind we is were, being... Absolutely. We still are. Still just, are. They're, they're, they, <laughs> yeah, but just a lot less, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're getting there. We're, we're working back to it. So, Farhan, uh, Natasha talked about how in the 60s and the 70s, live music was a way for... Um, a more popular music to kind of experiment and grow and kind of find a different sound. But Sarid, the, the music that Sarid does, most of it is live because there are performances that were that were performed at the APMC, right? Absolutely. Yeah. All of the all of the recordings that we have on Sarid music are live. See, the thing with classical music is there's a lot of spontaneity in it mm. and there's a lot of improvisation in it. The underlying yeah. composition, very crudely put, which is the rag, is in the public domain in any case. Yes. It's the same rag. Ustad Ashraf Sharif Khan would be playing rag Eman and then mm. uh, Ustad Nisiruddin Sami would be singing rag Eman and then Ustad Fateh Ali Khan would be singing rag Eman. It's the same rag. But there's so much spontaneity and uh, improvisation in it, mm. which only really comes out when they're live performances. So classical music has really always shined in live events, mm. which is what the music conference does, yes. uh, which is where the music conference started and still does. So all of our recordings so far mm -hmm. are from those live performances. Uh, and there's, a, I mean, like I mentioned, it's, it's for classical music, live events are critical for its development. And like I mentioned, Nuzara Kazim, for example, yes. was talking about, you know, how she heard Rag Pilu for from 20 years ago in Rag Pilu now, and she saw the development of it. And the reason for that development is the classical music uh, tends to stay connected with the audience uh, and, and with the times. And because of its improvisational nature. Yeah, yeah, because it has space so it will to sound evolve. Very different. Hmm. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Then, so I when people ask how. me, how are how are people how are you, why are younger people listening to it? And I, <laughs> you know, it, it just because it stays with the times. It's just like like Natasha mentioned, classical music just has had a bad PR game, <laughs> and uh, we're we're hopefully we will hopefully change that with Sara music. Uh, I was very <laughs> right before the show when we were talking. I was very uh, you know I was very happy to hear that you thought it was cool. A number of young people have written in to us. Uh, one person called me through my, you know, he, he got my connect, uh, my number and he said, this is so cool. Um, it is. And it's a beautiful app. And this is what I was sort of ha only half jokingly saying this, that it's really beautiful because you have your music. But then you also have these wonderful paintings and they're miniature. Are they miniatures on the app? 
Well, it depends on the on, on what you're what looking, you're looking at, at, right? So, yeah. so the uh, the album covers are not miniatures; those are those are graphically made. Yeah. But then you have, uh, so for example, my background right now is a one of the paintings from Rag Mala from I believe it's 1680. Oh, so yeah. Rag Mala is is a collection of paintings of rags all the way from 1500s all the way to into the 1800s. Oh wow. So I didn't so I did not realize you could paint an interpretation of a rag. That's fantastic. So it is it is it, they're, the, they're beautiful. Hmm. Uh, and we're using those paintings. For example, the painting that you see behind me is a painting of rag meg mm -hmm. which is a rag that you specifically single play during the monsoon season. Yes. Meg from Mega of course. Oh, I love that. And do you think that um, having an app, which is, again, a very sort of modern way of disseminating any kind of, of information, like when I, I get your emails, I get emails from Sade, not your emails. <laughs> and I like how a lot of them say this is the world premiere of this particular song or this particular rag or this particular piece of music. And I think that really stayed with me because an app and an app like Sade gives a very local um, performance a global stage. So remember, these are all live performances that yes. happened at the music, you know, all Pakistan music conference. In Lahore. Over yeah. in Lahore. This is Lahore. a very specific thing. <laughs> and one would imagine you don't have a lot of content from a specific city, one particular organization. But the fact that we've had so many performances over such a long duration of time means we actually do have a lot of content in there. Yes. And the, it's the the music is is just incredible. The uh, the app just provides you access to a whole range of just incredible stars, uh, and you can you know very easily find your favorite rag or you know if you're listening if you want if in the afternoon you want to listen to something you can find the particular rag for that time period and just listen to it because rags are also so associated with a particular time of day with a particular season mm -hmm. uh, because those notes are supposed to uh, complement the time of day they complement the season so it makes it uh, i mean it it gels together very well yeah, yeah. And then there's a sort of, there's a reason why the, that sort of particular sound has to be for a particular time of day. And the way that the app is structured, does it lead you to those particular things? It, it's sort of, it's easy to navigate if you wanted to find it as well. We would like to think so. Think so. That's yes. the idea of how we've developed it. Yeah. <laughs> so we have playlists. We have playlists there, right. which say, okay, so these, these are morning rugs and these are afternoon hmm. rugs and these are evening yeah. rugs. But then a lot of people have come to us and said, all right, so what do we? You know, we're new to this. We really like what we're hearing. Where yeah. do we go? Yeah. So we're in the process of developing a radio station of sorts, where mm -hmm. you know all you have to do is click on the, you know, there'll be a radio icon there. Uh, you just have to click on it and it'll play rags for your particular, you know, d if you've given access to your information on uh, date and uh, time and weather, yeah, yeah. on what the time is, it'll automatically play those rags and what the weather is, it'll ma automatically play those rags. Uh, so you're connected, uh, connected to the music uh, with your particular situation. That's so cool. I love technology. But it's also interesting because it's also, to me, it sounds like a way of educating an audience about the sort of uh, ins and outs of classical music and its sort of connection with your environment and yourself and, you know, all of these sort of aspects that um, one wouldn't really understand if you just sort of listened to something randomly. Absolutely. That is... That is the hope. We're not there yet in terms of education, yeah. but we are. We want to get there. We want once we, you know, are through enough of the content just in terms of music that we have, then we want to move on to podcasts. Like I mean, ah. what you mentioned in the podcast mm -hmm. would have all of this educational content where you have people, you know, who want are more interested in rag Eman or rag yeah. Khambavati yeah. Yeah. or rag Bhairvi. And you can go and then listen to what are the nuances of it, how is it developed, you know, what are the yeah. notes, how, is, how does yeah. it move and 
all those details that I have no idea about. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I don't but even if one to day. know a lot about music. <laughs> but I if just, one day. I'm just an enthusiast. I'm just yeah. an enthusiast who wants to give people more access to an incredible genre of music that is really deeply ingrained in our country, in our soil. Uh, and, you know, it's something that really a lot of people are missing out on. Quite right. And also kind of a way, something as familiar as an app, I think also takes away that sense of tentativeness about classical music as well. Because again, the assumption always is that if you like classical music or if you're interested in it, then you have to be kind of educated about it and know it. And there's a certain sophistication that one seems that one should have as opposed to just listening to something and thinking it's really beautiful and, you know, that's enough. <laughs> Absolutely. That, so there are always stages of development, right? I mean, you can't automatically say, okay, this, there's this one music genre, which is classical music, and I am now going to first learn about it and then going to ah, listen to exactly. it. Exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, you yeah. would tend to first listen to it. And then you'd say, oh, so this is really interesting. What's going mm. on? Oh, so I heard, you know, Rag Pilu from 98. Uh, and I heard Rag Pilu from 2000. They sound different, but why do they sound different? And yeah. what's going on? Yeah, so that's like, what then <laughs> develops. And that's what developed the in, develop interest of, yes. you know, what is the, uh, uh, you, oh, you know, what the, the details and the educational aspects of it are really mm. trying to understand what it is. I mean, stuff like what Natasha is doing in terms yes. of when, when she added a, a lot of context on, you know, uh, the, the, the music that was developed uh, in, you know, Pakistan in the past, we want to start adding that context as well. Uh, but yes. for us, it starts with people just simply listening to yes. the music. Mm. And, and then the really next begins, stage would be that. Yes. And on that note, we're going to take a very quick break and come back. Stay with us. Hi, welcome back to the coffee table. I hope that you picked up the pun I made before this break. If you did, let me know. <laughs> Natasha, did you get it? Did you get no. it? No. I didn't no. get it, no matter. I said on I'm this sorry. note, on this note, oh, take no. a break. <laughs> okay. Get off my show. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. Sorry, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> the audiences are going to be like shocked because they'll be like, you're bullying your guests. But this is a disclaimer, Natasha is my friend, so I can say these things too. <laughs> yeah. So, Mina, Mina has APA status, so she's allowed. <laughs> and nobody else can do this. But <laughs> yes. So, a <clears throat> more serious tone. Uh, so, we were talking before the break about how, uh, unless you have access to music, it, unless you can hear music, you can't have an opinion about it, and you can't sort of know what to think about it unless you can listen to it. And if it sparks an interest, then you can sort of delve deeper into it. So do you think that with your work with Peshkash, and also because you are um, one of the people who run the Lahore Music Meet, so you have, there's a kind of, um, I'm phrasing this very awkwardly. So with Peshkash, you're looking at the past, and with the Music Meet, you're looking at present music. And do you feel like there's a sort of a gap there that you are basically trying to bridge with both um, events, things? I think that, that that you've put it very you know well, um, in that there is such a huge disconnect because not only am I looking at artists coming and performing at LMM or at other music festivals, I'm also trying to place myself as a musician who has grown up in Pakistan her entire life but has primarily heard Western music, and it was much easier for me to buy a guitar and pick up you know, uh, guitar lessons than it ever was for me as primarily a vocalist to get an ustad. I got my first ustad at the age of 22 by accident. Wow. You know, so it's mm. definitely, yeah, definitely it's a matter mm. of access. It's a, yeah, I know, I tried. That's okay. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I'm not judging. <laughs> But in terms of there being access, I think that's the big kind of headliner in this because with something like classical music, it has centuries of kind of secrecy with the gharana system. And there's a, the, I mean, the environment around it was 
you know, curated to the point where only a select few or a very elite few um, individuals could truly enjoy it. And that's, I think, the case with classical music around the world, mm-hmm. whether it's Western, whether it's Eastern, you know, it, it, it exists in that sense. Yeah. But in terms of having access myself, it was not available to me beyond Indus music in my lifetime. Again, why Peshkash and all of these things are so... Basically that I, I grew up where, you know, Basant Basant was cancelled, where yes. all of the live functions you would be having at the Lahore Fort or in Andhrun Sher or at somebody's house, PTV's rooftop, anywhere. Any of these places, these no longer have that kind of access point. Physical music stores no longer exist. I don't know where to find my music and there's a lot of noise on Line. So yeah, the yeah. the idea that there is a creator, which is your musician, your artist, then you have a curator, which is what you know right now me and Farhan in this context are doing, which is yeah. taking all of this music and all of this essential you know bag of lots of noise mm-hmm. and making sure that that is being then given to you know an audience, which is the consumer. Yeah. So if you consider this an ecosystem, I'm just trying to fill in the gaps. For me, it's truly been, because my research over the past four years has been just trying to understand what my musical past is. And Mm -hmm. by mine, I mean as a Pakistani musician who is making music in English and in Urdu using primarily Western tools. Where do I stand? It's Mm. it's all an identity crisis happening and, and kind of relying on music as a crutch to explain to me as, you know, a 28 year old at, in, you know, in Pakistan where, my music stands does it have a place is it pakistani enough these are all questions that you know kind of spring up with a lot of musicians and that's why there's a general in contemporary music a lot of trends to go back to covers which right. is a whole other problem because you know in classical music you can't really say someone's doing a cover if yeah. someone is singing the same bandish the same rag you're not saying that that person's doing a cover so i yeah. think i'm trying to understand pakistan's or south asians south asia's music in a way that doesn't necessarily transpose Western ideals upon it. How do mm. we as, you know, South Asians, as Pakistanis, try to understand and access our own music without kind of whitewashing it or, you know, packaging it to the extent where you lose the essence of it and have to dumb it down or kind of build it up to another, you know, and some, another country's ecosystem or history mm. or heritage? Yeah. No, I think that's really important. And I'm sort of, again, now thinking about the kind of um, innovations that were happening in the 60s and the 70s, because in a way, music is a global language as well. And music that's being produced here and music that's being produced, let's say, in London or in you know, wherever, in Barcelona, uh, everybody is sort of connected, right? And Farhan mentioned this as well, where people in Argentina are listening to Sare, for example, or like from Peshkash's Instagram, uh, Finders Keepers Records is based in England somewhere. And there are a bunch of white dudes who listen to like 70s Lollywood music, which I find fantastic. <laughs> so we I also. Think that's great. <laughs> yeah. Tell us more about that. About that. <laughs> I love it. So, I mean, to be fair, like, I mean, obviously, it's always a little sketch when Goras are handling, uh, you know, yeah. local music. But to be fair, like, these organizations, people like Finders Keepers, people like Disco Stan, they have genuinely be, been the ones to, you know, bring me, bring to light to me that the, this music has existed. Because yeah. one of your major things is that your local media, your local television, your local textbooks, anything is not going to give you these names. You know, I yes. was lucky enough to grow up listening to Sahil Rana songs and being able to attach a memory to that. Yes, but then absolutely. I had never mm. heard of M. Ashraf or I, yes. I had I never knew of these names. You know, mm. I I had maybe heard one Nahid Akhtar song, but not another kind of genre. So f- this person had then curated Finders Keepers or all of these organizations that are based in Europe. And there's a huge market for Pakistani records in Europe and in India, like huge market. That's fantastic. Um, I love on our that. Bishkash Instagram. We mm. shared um, our vin- the vinyl dealers that I could find yes. over the past couple of months. And they're sweet, really passionate people who have been collecting vinyls. One of them, uh, Hussain Saab, has inherited his father's music shop from Ooh. like, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Mm. Mm. So such wonderful stories that, you know, go with that. But beyond, again, uh, uh, external influences or, you know, kind of foreign interest within Pakistani music, there's so many wonderful stories that we're being able to collect because not only are we 
be digitizing our content uh, or whatever, not our content, but whatever we can find to preserve it. Mm. But we're also trying to collect oral narratives from people who are still alive because there was a huge mass migration ah. of, you know, Christian musicians in the, mm. in the late 70s to places like Canada and America. Mm. So to hear their experience and, to, you know, just relive their memories, that's been such an excellent kind of deep dive into what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. what music no, looked like I think that that's then. really, really wonderful. That through Peshkash and through Sare, we are able to sort of realize that our identity as Pakistani, our Pakistani sonic music, music or sort of history is a really rich and diverse one. And we have, uh, in a way, kind of like the best of both worlds um, here, in, in a way, because we have this rich history of the classical tradition, and then we also have... Our, our position as people who are out there in the world consuming all kinds of, of music and, you know, making it our own in our own particular ways. So um, thank you so much, both of you, for being on the show with me today. Good luck in all your music, music conservation work. I am a huge fan and audience, I urge you to look up both items, things, organizations <laughs> on your social media and get acquainted with our wonderfully diverse musical history. Thank you for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we will see you next time on The Coffee Table. Bye now. Mm -hmm.